the International Anthony Burgess Foundation podcast. Earthly Powers, Part 2. The Old World and the New. Earthly Powers is Anthony Burgess's longest and most accomplished novel. It was first published in 1980, and the International Anthony Burgess Foundation is releasing a series of podcasts to mark its 40th anniversary. Earthly Powers is a novel with a global perspective. Kenneth Toomey's life as a writer of great renown takes him to almost every continent and sees him engaging with people from many different nationalities. Yet at the core of the novel is the opposition between the old world of Europe and the new world of America. Like many writers of his generation, Burgess was preoccupied with the conflict between the new culture of America and the traditions of Europe, and it was the focus of some of his first works of fiction, including One Hand Clapping in 1961 and Honey for the Bears in 1963. In the second of these novels, his protagonist, Paul Hussey, declares that somebody has got to conserve the past, meaning historical Europe, before America makes plastic of the world. These observations were made years before Burgess had any direct experience of the United States, but his relationship with the New World, which was in turns both difficult and profitable, would begin in earnest in 1966. In the 1970s, following several years of teaching at American institutions, Burgess was interviewed by Playboy magazine, and he attempted to elucidate his opinion of the country. Princeton, New Jersey, is ultra-exclusive and very like England. They fear the visiting writer is a potential danger that he will get drunk or get them drunk. But I did some teaching in New York and enjoyed that. I like America when I am out west or travelling. It's a much more dynamic place than England, though. At Princeton, I followed Elizabeth Bowen as resident writer, and Philip Roth used to come in and lecture. Where would you get that in England? From the mid-1960s to the end of his life, Burgess experienced America as a university teacher at several institutions, including Princeton, City College New York, the University of Buffalo, and the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He also spent a month at the University of Iowa, where his symphony was performed in 1975. Yet Burgess also experienced a more glamorous side of America, specifically Hollywood. Burgess's first foray into screenwriting was in 1968, when the actor and producer William Conrad recruited him to write a musical based on the life of Shakespeare. In Hollywood, Burgess found that he was paid a great deal but his creative projects never came to fruition. Any cash I have in the bank was made not from my primary trade of novelising, but from writing scripts for films that were never made. And so it always seemed at the time of my signing the book-length contract never had any chance of being made. One occasionally has hopes, less occasionally the hopes are fulfilled, but nine-tenths of the screenplays written are doomed never to reach the floor. In Earthly Powers, Kenneth Toomey has much better fortune in the Hollywood Hills and has his screenplays made into successful films. Burgess's screenwriting success came in Europe, with his scripts for the Anglo-Italian co-productions Moses the Lawgiver and Jesus of Nazareth and his linguistic work on the French film Quest for Fire. Where Toomey can adapt his art from the old world traditions to the new world of the screen, Burgess admits he found this aspect of writing difficult, perhaps revealing a more European sensibility in his work. I had to educate myself in a new technique, even a new grammar, learning how to clip dialogue, move cameras about, when to use two shots and long shots and close-ups. I worked hard, but with a kind of hopelessness. In 
Early in earthly powers, Europe and America are established as oppositional places, and throughout the novel, the friction between them plays a vital role in the story. The world of the movies stands in opposition to the world of the London stage, though Toomey manages to navigate both with success. Yet that is not the only opposition between Europe and America in the novel. Like Burgess, Toomey is a product of the old traditions of Europe, in particular his Catholicism, lapsed though it is. Unlike Burgess, Toomey has Anglo-French heritage and can trace his ancestry to the continent. From early in the novel, Burgess attempts to describe Toomey's European experience in opposition to America. I have always cherished the smells of places and eras. The whole of 1916 had a mingled smell of unaired rooms, unwashed socks, bloody khaki, musty mufti, the rotting armpits of women's dresses, margarine, cheap gaspers of floor sweepings, floor swept with the aid of damp tea leaves. It was a very un-American smell, one might say. The smell of my father's house, however, mingled the neutral surgical and the Anglo-French domestic. In his writing, Burgess often personifies Europe as an earthy and sensual place, where the people are shabbily dressed and smell of garlic, and the cities are rougher and more chaotic than their American counterparts. Paris, Burgess says, smells of Gaulois cigarettes, whereas he depicts America as the land of refrigerators and ice drinks, Coca-Cola and a sort of standardised cleanness. It is also a land of plenty, where opportunities for overindulgence are rife. In Earthly Powers, one character personifies this conflict between these two worlds, Carlo Campanati. Our mother, you understand, was born in the United States, uh, in New Jersey, though Italian. Our father met her when he was in America on business, and he brought her back to Milan, or near it, the place of the famous cheese Gorgonzola. She insisted very much that we should learn English. It was the language of the future, she said. Carlo embodies both European and American traits. He is a Catholic priest who was brought up in Italy and has a sensual and coarse nature. Yet he is a reformer who is prone to large American appetites and is at home on American television chat shows. Even his childhood home is described as rather American, foreshadowing indeed the flavour of a holiday inn. Perhaps most notably, though, is Carlo's own religious philosophy. It focuses on notions of original sin and free will, ideas which Burgess developed throughout his career and describes in an article for the New York Times magazine in 1971. When Europe, after millennia of war, rapine, slavery, famine, intolerance had sunk to the level of a sewer, America became the golden dream, the Eden, where innocence could be recovered. Original sin was the monopoly of that dirty continent over there. In America, man could glow in an aura of natural goodness, driven along his shining path by divine reason. Progress was possible, and the wrongs committed against the Indians, the wildlife, the land itself, could be explained away in terms of the rational control of the environment necessary for the building of a new Jerusalem. Right and wrong made up the moral dichotomy. Evil, that great eternal, inextirpable entity, had no place in America. When Toomey moves to Hollywood to work in the film industry, Carlo arrives to present him with his manifesto for the reform of the Catholic Church. He wants to deny the concept of original sin and highlight the importance of free will. In Burgess's own writing, 
This can be seen as an impulse of Carlo's American heritage. This idea is reinforced once Carlo is made Pope, and we see him sermonising on American television. He reveals his view of Christianity as an American-style melting pot of beliefs, rather than the cold traditions of Europe. He explains his vision. Until recently, it was assumed that the fraternity of which the Bishop of Rome is the head was sealed off, arrogant in the claim of its sole legitimacy, the only begetter of Christian authority. I think that view is dying now. I think that I and my brothers are helping to kill it. So I say that Christianity is the Tin Baptist Chapel in Arkansas as well as St. Peter's in Rome. America, then, is the perfect symbol of Carlo's non-traditional desire to reform the Church, whereas Europe, with its weight of history and scars of war, is somewhere to escape from. After Carlo's initial sojourn in America, he is forced to return to Milan, where he is miserable but believes that it is part of his mandatory service if he wants to become Pope. The impulse to escape from Europe to America can also be seen in Toomey, but for slightly different reasons. Throughout the novel, Toomey is searching for a place to call home. In Toomey's narrative, America is an aspirational place that promises a freedom that he cannot achieve in prohibitive Europe. This freedom is reflected in Toomey's Hollywood Hotel, The Garden of Allah, bringing to mind his suppressed novel about the joys of same-sex desire, The Way Back to Eden. Yet the promise of this new Eden is polluted for Toomey. While he discovers a land of opportunity and freedom, it is one with a darker heart more redolent of what he witnesses in the concentration camps and debauchery of war-ravaged Europe. What Toomey witnesses in the aftermath of the liberation of Buchenwald is a haunting and gruesome end to the cruelty of the war years. It is the embodiment of human evil, but Toomey describes the scenes in a distinctly European way. He sees fragments of a Latin textbook, compares a camp prisoner to Michelangelo's David, the sky to a Picasso painting, and the smell of decay to Gorgonzola cheese. Buchenwald, to Toomey, is the ultimate evil in a continent that is irreparably damaged. It also represents his own ultimate rejection of God and religion. <laughs> I wanted to have Carla with me there to smell the ripe gorgonzola of innate human evil and dare to say that mankind was God's creation and hence good. Good? That's what I am, sir. It was the devil made me do it. Man was not God's creation. That was certain. God only knew from what suppurating primordial dung heap man had arisen. As Toomey's faith in God is destroyed by his experiences in post-war Europe, his faith in America remains. Yet throughout the novel, this faith is tested. The brutal killing of Carlo's brother Raffaele is brought about by prohibition in the United States, and this episode provides Toomey with his first experience of evil in an American context. Yet, it is an event towards the end of the novel that truly corrupts Toomey's vision of a new Eden and complicates Carlo's ideas of America being devoid of original sin. The mass suicide of Godfrey Manning's cult members. Manning presided over the almost instantaneous deaths of 1700 adults. The children did not die, they spat out the bitter host. He saw from his podium what he had often tried to imagine, his imagination being much assisted by pictorial evidence of Nazi camp slaughter, uncountable slumping bodies, as though awkwardly trying to get down to prey in the impossible space between rows of bucket seats. Despite invoking images of European slaughter, 
Burgess portrays Manning's cult as a distinctly American entity. Just as he described Buchenwald in European terms, Toomey describes the suicide of the children of God in American terms, focusing on Manning's Tiffany Leiter, comparing the scene not to Michelangelo or Picasso, but the films of Abbott and Costello. Based on the real-life Jonestown cult, in which the members were poisoned en masse by tainted Kool-Aid, Manning's cult shows religious belief corrupted by a charismatic showman who preys on a sense of rootlessness in American young adults and has mysterious reserves of cash. The cult is portrayed as a product of California, the dark underbelly of a state that has given Toomey so much wealth and comfort. But Burgess also uses the idea of the cult to demonstrate the ways in which he believes some forms of Christian worship have taken a dangerous path in 20th century America, an idea he articulates in an article for the New York Times in 1971. Of course, America was built on rejection of the past. Even the basic Christianity which was brought to the continent in 1620 was of a novel and bizarre kind that would have nothing to do with the great rank river of belief that produced Dante and Michelangelo. America as a nation has never been able to settle to a common belief more sophisticated than the dangerous naivety of the Declaration of Independence. Life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness, indeed. And now America, filling in the vacuum left by the liquefied British Empire, has the task of telling the rest of the world that there's something better than communism. The something better can only be money-making and consumption for its own sake. In the name of this ghastly creed, the jungles must be defoliated. Earthly Powers is, at its core, the story of the 20th century, and the conflict between the old world and the new is an essential backdrop. But the one thing both places have in common is a sense of disappointment. For Toomey, Europe cannot live up to its promise of high culture and artistic experimentation. The modernist innovation of Ulysses is, after all, reduced to a bawdy musical. And America cannot live up to its promise of freedom and wealth, the Edenic beauty of the nation gives way to mass murder. If Toomey cannot find his home in the New World, Burgess was slightly more open to the promises of America. After his first visit in 1966, his fiction focused more and more on America in American culture, and most of his novels have either scenes set in the United States or characters from there. He articulated his feelings about America in 1971, I no longer live in England, and I can't spend more than six months at a stretch in Italy or any other European country for that matter. I home to America as to a country more stimulating than depressing. The future of mankind is being worked out there on a scale typically American, vast, dramatic, almost apocalyptical. I brave the brutality and the guilt in order to be in on that scene. It's clear that he found America so stimulating that his fiction attempted to incorporate scenes from both sides of the Atlantic. Beard's Roman Women takes place in Los Angeles and Rome. MF takes place in New York, Italy and a Caribbean island based heavily on Malta. The End of the World News contains stories set in New York, the French Alps and Vienna. Burgess announced his intention to write a novel titled The Hunters Are Up in America, shortly before his death in 1993. This suggests his interest in the country was still strong at the end of his life. Earthly Powers is perhaps his most successful attempt to bring together the culture of the United States and Europe in his fiction, and the novel has always had a strong appeal to both American and European readers, an appeal which continues to this day. You have been listening to the International Anthony Burgess Foundation podcast. It was written and narrated by Graham Foster. Readings were by Paul Barnhill. The music was by Anthony Burgess. 
For more information about Anthony Burgess and earthly powers, visit www.anthonyburgess.org.